Hi, Stella. Hi, Sasha. How's it going? Good. Um, we had our pal Carrie Mendoza back on today. It was great. Yeah, I've, re- I've really got to know Carrie in the last, I don't know, eight months or so. And I consider her a good friend now. We we were in London together and we worked very hard in the W Path Files. So um, she has so much to offer, I think, as a working doctor in the ER in Chicago, that she gives a real practical insight to what's going on with doctors. Sometimes I think our world, Sasha, is so theoretical and academic and research based that we forget like this is being led by the the people on the ground and i i think the more we can get people like carrie involved the faster we'll get through all this yeah what's particularly interesting about carrie i mean first of all she's brilliant and she helps us understand kind of how medical bureaucracy operates um you know people on the outside tend to have lots of different theories about you know how is it that kids are being transitioned and given mastectomies and things like that. And there's all kinds of theories which probably play a role, right? Like, oh, follow the money or, um, you know, some kind of communo-Marxist overtaking of institutions. Like, and then there's the academic piece and then there's the medical um, kind of care as consumer care. Like there's all these things that do play a role. However, Carrie just kind of tells us about the the very mundane day-to-day operations of a physician. And we talked about something which we've never really heard anyone talk about, which is community health versus a teaching hospital or university hospital. So that was really interesting. Um, And she worked through and lived through the opioid crisis. So, you know, she shared a lot of stories about what that was like working with patients who became addicted to these drugs and how similarities exist between the kind of like social pressure to affirm gender, just like there was the social and kind of professional pressure to write prescriptions. So there's, there's a lot of overlap. And, and another thing that featured in our conversation, which I didn't see, cause I, you know, I, I, I know Carrie well, so the some of it I, I had heard before, but we, 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 we inadvertently, started speaking about medical marijuana in the bonus content. And it was really, really interesting. This whole, this overprescription of drugs in general for children is, is it's a huge issue that it feels like it's bubbling, as, you know, under the pot here. And then the prescription of medical marijuana, she, it was revelatory what she was saying. I didn't it's know shocking. any of it. Yeah, she Me kind neither. of described in the, the Substack content that, there are people who are chronically throwing up because of the levels of THC in their system. I've never even heard of something like that. Me and neither. I'm not unfamiliar with marijuana and how yeah. it operates. But like, oh my God, I did not know. People are developing like medical, really serious medical issues. And generally speaking, the overprescription of medications is huge. And I, you know, I'm reading Abigail Schreier's book, which you wrote a review oh, about recently. Yeah. And she talks about this as one of the many, many issues we really need to grapple with in mental health and generally. So uh, th- this interview with Carrie feels like we really touched on some areas that we're kind of missing gaps in our knowledge. And I think we keep having those experiences lately, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay, so I'm going to read Carrie's bio yeah. and then we'll jump in. So Carrie Mendoza is a healthcare policy advocate, social entrepreneur, and the former director of FAIR in Medicine with the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. And she recently has become the current director of Genspect USA. Dr. Mendoza mm-hmm. is a practicing emergency medicine physician with over 20 years of experience working in rural, suburban and urban hospitals treating everything from snake bites to gunshot wounds to COVID-19 patients. She's a medical technology inventor with two patents for an emergency department communications app. Her practical experience provides unique insights into the American medical system and how the modern healthcare bureaucracy can scale harmful policies while ignoring negative side effects. Dr. Mendoza draws from her experience with the opioid epidemic to highlight the lessons learned about its origin scale and mitigation, shedding light on how these insights can inform our understanding of medicalizing radical gender ideology and preventing its harms. So we hope you enjoy our lovely conversation with Dr. Carrie Mendoza. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. 
And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. And this is Gender, A Wider Lens, a podcast dedicated to the shifting concepts around gender in our contemporary culture. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we seek to open up the discourse around this hot button issue. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Stella and Carrie. Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be back. We're thrilled to have you, Carrie. (laughs) Yeah, we had you on a couple of weeks ago for the live stream where we talked about the WPATH files, and it was really wonderful to have you on to flush that out. We want to definitely come back to that. But before we started, you know, we were just talking about something interesting. Stella and I both said, oh, we've never heard anyone talk about this, which is the difference between community mental health centers and hospitals affiliated with academic institutions. And that has not really dawned on me until I heard you talk about that. So can you tell our audience a little bit about what is the difference between those two settings and and what are, what are the things we can glean from like taking your kid to one or the other, what might happen at each? Uh, Sure. Um, You know, I practice emergency medicine and I have been largely in community settings, which the difference between kind of community settings, we call it, and academic settings is that in community hospitals, typically there aren't training programs associated with the hospital. So you don't have levels of residents, medical students, fellows, um, and there's so there's less of an academic orientation Um, And there's more just the, uh, you know, services of, you know, in the ER, what we do and, you know, cardiology and just the different services the hospital offers, but not a function of a training center. And so I think that's, you know, a real big difference for people to understand, because as we've seen some of the changes in academia that have affected healthcare and affected medical schools, there's been a radicalization where you know the students are are really kind of seeing are being taught to see a lot of things through a social justice lens and not necessarily purely what you know is the medical problem how are we treating that and so i think in the community setting we just have much less of those type of pressures in our environment um i don't have you know students that are Um, misaligned with like our mission in the emergency department, you know, so that is a big thing. And in terms of mental health, obviously the emergency department for the United States, we are the front door for mental health emergencies. So for example, if at a school um, or in a therapist's office, somebody says, oh, I, I suicidal, you know, I want to hurt myself. They get sent to the ER. That's the the majority of the flow, how it's supposed to be legally. So in the community setting, again, we have um, non-academic um, but well-trained uh, counselors who uh, do the mental health assessments in conjunction with uh, therapists, depending on what level of engagement we get into based on the seriousness of the case. And I'm in charge of making sure they're medically clear, that there's not an acute medical issue, might be related to an ingestion or some other, you know, do they have a urinary tract infection? So my job is purely medical, and then I work in conjunction with the mental health staff. But at the community level, there just isn't the injection of the ideological framework, at least from my experience where where I've been practicing. Are there examples outside of gender where you might see more of an ideological approach in like an academic research university kind of medical institution versus community mental health? Or is this predominantly in the world of gender right now? Well, I, it really has fallen under, um, in healthcare, what's been called social determinants of health. That was a terminology a term I started seeing, oh, maybe 20 years ago or so. And it really kind of, to me, is just um, really more the, the social context someone's living in. And, and those are all things in emergency medicine we always would be thinking of. So, for example, 
you know, does someone live alone or do they, you know, are they struggling to be able to get their medications? Are they struggling to be able to get to their doctor's appointments? These are all the things in the ER we have always been trained to think about because we only see someone in a little, you know, a brief time period. I may never see them again in in my life. I mean, we do have some frequent flyers, we call them. But the point is, we think (laughs) very globally as to what is how what can I, what I need to do everything for this person as much as I can before they walk out the door or, you know, some people get admitted, but we're, we're trying to just do everything we can to make it successful for them later. And so this social determinants of health, um, it sort of became this euphemism that for us was just sort of the social work things we would do and have case managers do. And I think what's happened is it, it, it along with this ideologic pull we see in gender, it, you, some of that, um, this social determinants of health has got racialized where there was a lot of, you know, um, looking at disparate impacts and just saying it's because of race, for example. That's the other big one. Um, and I, you know, yeah, I work in the in one of the hospitals, my favorite hospital I work at is in the, it serves largely the black community in an area of Chicago. And, um, you know, it, it's really, it's it's just the real world where people just are taking care of people for their medical conditions. It's not looking at people based on their skin color. We're, we're, our staff is, is very mixed. Um, we are just doing the best by every patient. So I think um, there's just been this overall kind of ideologic pull. But again, in my community hospital environment, I really, I've been fortunate. I, I really haven't seen that with the people I work with or, um, you know, the patient's um, you know, expecting different things based on, you know, ideologic categories at all. It's been noticeable to me, uh, Carrie, because you and I have been working a lot together in the last few months, yeah. is that you're saying that the, you know, the, they're, they're not, the, the, the doctors in the ER who are on the front line, they're not up on the latest research and not particularly interested in the l- latest research. They're following the protocols as far as I I can gather from you. I think this is key for us to understand what's going on in in doctors and hospitals these days. Yeah, it, it, I think it, Stella, it really, it really depends, at least in the United States, like what part of the country, as well as if you're more community based versus an academic medical center. Um, and I think also what part of healthcare you're in. Again, emergency medicine. Um, in the United States is, is, you know, there are obviously a lot of pressures on us. There's still protocol things that, that go on related to, you know, things not in our realm, like, like, for example, sepsis, you know, they've, they've decided, oh, you have to treat it a certain way. Well, we were always treating it the right way, but they're trying to document uh, value in the system. So they pull, put out these protocols that are top down. But, you know, for the ER, we're, you know, a little bit immune to things because we, you know, people people come in, we don't have control who comes through the door in the United States. You cannot, it's illegal to turn people away based on insurance or anything. And we deal with urgent, you know, mostly urgent or emergent issues and there's no one saying, oh, you have to have pre-authorization for this or you can't do that. So it is kind of this world of like, you know, pure medicine and you are close there. You you do something and you see the effect in the sense of like I order something, I have to act on the test result or I order a lab, I have to act on that. And I think what's happened in the United States, at least there's a big divide between the outpatient doctors, what they can do, what they can order, and then like the results they see later. So we're just very instantaneous. And it just, the kind of people that also come into the ER, you know, are comfortable functioning in that environment where you have to iterate, you have to change. And we don't have people over us saying, hey, you know, you can't do X, you can't do Y. Um, because we have to solve the problem right then. 
So it, 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 yeah, it's very different than say if a pediatrician is in their office and they have a distressed child come in and they're sitting there saying, you know, how I, you know, they want to do, you know, I've never met doctors who are trying to like do bad by patients. You know, they're, they're trying to do the best they can. But when, if you're in an outpatient clinic and somebody comes to your office and you can't ultimately solve the problem, but you're unsure, you're concerned that their risk level of what's going on is too high just to send them home, you're going to, you're going to send them to the next level of care, which is in our country, you know, usually the ER. Um, so I, I think that it, it really depends on the type of doctor, the practice environment they're in, um, and the resources they have around them. I, I want to keep yeah. talking about that because um, sure. There, there's a tendency for some people to say stuff like, well, these doctors should all be put in jail or I can't believe they're doing this. And, and I think you can help us understand on a more kind of practical day to day level. How do um, procedures end up occurring at a high rate that end up harming patients down the line? Before we get to that, I am really curious in your community center, community health center in Chicago with a predominantly black population, are you seeing adolescents coming in with high rates of gender dysphoria? You know, I I am not in that in that one in, in the hospital with the larger black community. I I've, I've seen it a couple times, um but not um, just as an independent, isolated thing, it would be uh, a young person who had multiple other mental health issues already diagnosed, who already had had um, inpatient psychiatric admissions. And now the, the ident gender identity issue was presenting, you know, now in you know down the stream from all this yeah. other other stuff so i've seen that a few times a few times what i what i have seen across the board in whatever communities i've worked in is um and maybe we'll get into this later is just the in my opinion the over prescribing of medication for young people i mean that has yeah. been a trend in the past 25 years i've been working um younger and younger um, for, you know, children are prescribed on, I have diagnoses attached to them that I just never would have never saw even 15 years ago, you know, so yeah. like a 10 year old who's diagnosed with bipolar and then they're put on a med. Um, what, what, what I can say, I feel from, um, the more mixed community where there's predominantly, you know, middle-class, um, black community is, you know, um, and I think just all, overall, some, in my opinion, sometimes this, these meds are given, you know, for more things that are appear to be more behavioral problems, behavioral like, controls. you know, yeah, like, sure. oh, a boy who yeah. wouldn't, you know, isn't sitting still at school. I mean, Ooh, I have yeah. three boys. I, I have my opinions about that. I don't think schools yeah. these days are set up for boys mm. who want to be active, but so what I'm telling you is I, I, that seems to be a theme across it, For but, sure. um, you know, I also work in Southern Wisconsin in, in a great, a great area that is more, you know, uh, you know, mixed, but more predominantly Caucasian. Um, I have not seen, um, is as much there either with, the, um, you know, gender identity confusion, again, still a lot of young people with just depression, anxiety, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, I, I used to work at a hospital that served the, um, it was in the, the gay and uh, trans community in Chicago. Um, and uh, but that that was pre that was pre COVID, and there there were some different issues which I'm happy to talk about related to like electronic health record. But we may get into those kind of things mm. later. We hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as we are. We just wanted to take a quick moment and say thank you to all of our listeners. 
Your support helps us to keep the lights on and the mics hot. We recently made the switch to Substack so we could build a more robust listener community. Visit widerlenspod.com and check out the different subscription tiers. For just $8 a month, premium subscribers get access to weekly bonus content, discussion posts, and more. And founding members get the inside track on who's coming up with the show with the ability to submit their own questions for our esteemed guests. For those of you who are in need of parenting support and resources, we each have parent coaching membership groups. Plus, you can buy our book, When Kids Say They're Trans. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and get involved in the lively discourse in the comments section. Thank you so much. Now back to the show. So tell us then, how is it that we see on a massive scale, doctors, physicians, therapists, all of these providers going along with gender affirming care, despite the fact that there's really no robust evidence, despite the fact that uh, this was something totally unheard of just a few years ago. Like, how is that possible? Yeah, yeah, I did answer that question. So I'll get into, you know, to me, the best way I can explain it and understand it is what I experienced during the opioid crisis, which I know I talked about in my GenSpect um, talk in Denver, um, because there are striking parallels, right? It, 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 the, the problem that was trying to be solved was stated as better pain control, which again, it was coming from a place of who, who wants patients to suffer, right? Who, you know, we all want, we don't, we're not into the business of suffering, we're into the business of helping. <laughs> and so the premise makes a lot of sense, seems like it aligns with healthcare, just like with gender, we want to help distressed children. Who doesn't want to do that? But what I saw happen with the opioid crisis is there was um, a divergence between the stated goals, which were basically regulatory um, requirements that got put into place in the hospital and and doctors, whether you were a hospital employee or contracted with the hospital, they would write in your contract like, well, you have to meet these metrics for good pain control because the hospital was being graded on that by the government and the government was tying their reimbursements to the hospital metric about pain control. So again, you might think from a distance, well, what could be wrong with that? Like, wouldn't that be aligning incentives? Like the, the government says, this is an initiative, this makes sense, and, and let's line up all the incentives. Um, but what I saw in practice was it really, it, there, there was no nuance. So what started happening was they, they basically opened up the, the diagnosis and the pathway so wide that it was capturing people who didn't have chronic pain conditions like uh, that were debilitating. Like you would have thought, you know, a cancer patient, God forbid, obviously you don't want them to suffer or somebody who, you know, has, is a paraplegic from something, you don't, you don't want them to suffer. Um, but it got widened out where they were just saying, well, people who have chronic back pain or other chronic conditions and kind of the vagueness of it in conjunction with a mandate that tied to losing your credentials at the hospital or losing, you know, financial, um, you know, reimbursements, that just proved so powerful that just there were so many prescriptions written inappropriately for people and it caught in people who maybe already had addiction issues, now we're having an addiction to this, or never were addicted, but now we're addicted to this, or diverting because it became a street drug. So the point is, I started in the emergency department, again, we see all comers. We mm -hmm. see the people that can't get into primary care, or primary care in these pain clinics say, you're too much of a pain, no pun intended, go to the ER. We started seeing that, like unruly patients that were addicted. So I started seeing all these people coming in, like, why are they on all these medicines? And then on top of it, they're mad because they want me and my ER staff to write them the prescriptions. And, and it was like, wow, okay, this is inappropriate. But what I, the, what was, what I realized is that the hospital administration didn't have our backs. It was like, 
well, isn't there something you could do because we want good patient satisfaction score? So it was my first time seeing mm. that the ethical, what was ethical came like head on with what the, the giant bureaucracy wanted. And and you needed to be extremely strong to go against all that because you're going against maybe jeopardizing your group's contract with the hospital. You're going against, you know, the hospital firing you. You're going against all these things. You're going that this was the start of the patient experience scores. And every, I mean, this was, you know, before um, Obamacare and before social media and all that. But but all this thing about, you know, hospital scores and doctor scores and putting it up on the internet, all that was all just getting started. So the pressure to go along was immense. And I would see great people trying to figure out, well, I'll just maybe just give them a few tablets just to get them off my back. Or, oh, you know, I don't have time because a cardiac arrest is coming in. I'm just going to write the script. You could, you could, and these are not, these were not bad people that I, I worked with. Um, it just became people looking the other way and passing the buck. They didn't want to say, they didn't want to say no. And um, I see a lot of similarities, right? You could tell with gender, mm-hmm. I think the immense pressure to just go along or say yes, or kind of pass the buck, like, well, I don't know, go to the gender clinic. Even if you know, like, oh, that's, the the pressure to please the patient is is so immense in the power against everybody like you saw it just with the recent whistleblower in Washington state it's like well how is it that some bureaucrat is just overruling what a trained person is saying hey this assessment is wrong and i i, I am following these guidelines but you know i'm i'm seeing all these red flags here how is it that a bureaucrat is like saying, well, gee, sorry, too bad? Because that is what has grown up in healthcare that I think is important for people to understand. I'm not making an excuse for people to not do the right thing, but I think it's important for everyone to understand how the healthcare system really works versus how we want it to work. Because I think we still have a lot to do with some smart policy changes that make it so the incentives aren't lining up this way and also make it easier for doctors to be supported when they say no. Is that and Yeah, make sense? and Carrie, yeah. in fairness to your credit, I, I remember you telling me that like, you know, during the opioid, uh, you know, epidemic or crisis that, that people would be saying I'm going to complain about you um give me your name and they would complain about you and you know you call them something like opioid bullies or something or and then as well as that I remember you describing how you'd get into your car after a shift in tears from the relentless pressure prescribed yeah. these the opioids because the culture says that you should so mm-hmm. you know to your credit you withstood it but I think lots of people didn't yeah, it it was really, really hard because I, a couple of things, I was so blessed with, I had such an amazing um, medical school experience at the University of Chicago. Um, it was like heaven, you know, the people were so smart and it was just so, um, it, it just felt like just such a great learning environment with just super ethical people, like just the doing the best by the patients, but also really invested in teaching. And then when I went to Colorado, I trained at um, at Denver Health in, in Denver, which was uh, the top emergency medicine program at the time. Again, the most stellar, amazing people, learning, teaching, respect for all that. And so then when I got out into the community, I worked with amazing people, but I, I, and I'm sure there's a level this happens when you get out of, you know, the academic bubble, so to speak, Mm -hmm. you know, you're like, oh, the real world with business and how do we, you know, bill and do all this. So I think there's a little bit of that, but this ethical issue though, it just was devastating because when I realized I was on my own and also I didn't want to jeopardize the contract of my, we were a private group, the contract of my 
fellow partners, you know, but mm -hmm. I had some crazy things happen. I mean, I had people threaten me and I had to be walked out by security a couple of times. Cause as you know, I mean, it, it, there have been doctors who have been assaulted and shot because they wouldn't write prescriptions. And so I had a couple of times where I felt super uncomfortable after I said no to people who were very, you know, when you're, a, when addicts. people are in, I mean, yes, that's what I was going to no say. No longer when, acting like that, themselves. That's exactly right. And we deal with addicts of not just this, but obviously in the ER, all kinds of things. So they're desperate, right? Yeah. And, and and again, there was a lot of diversion. So people were also wanting pills to sell. So you're also mm. cutting them off from it. So I had the security drive walk me out to my car a couple of times. I, I had one time that you're mentioning quickly, Stella, like, a, and this is a similarity, I think, with gender, because there was a, a cohort of um, kind of late adolescent, early 20-something women who I think some somatization got caught up with the um, pills. Like, they would just be prescribed pills by people who were like, oh, here's for your you know, cr chronic abdominal pain that you, we've mm. had 50 CAT scans and all your, your gallbladder has been out. And yeah, one wow. young lady, when I came in, I mean, she was, I'll never forget it. I remember the exact room and the exact hospital I was at. She was there with her mom who looked distressed. Her complaint was abdominal pain. It was acute on chronic. But when I got into the whole thing, I mean, she, she her abdomen was fine. It wasn't like a surgical abdomen. It really was got into this whole thing that she was um, about to run out of her Dilaudid, which is a really strong opioid. And they needed the, the pain clinic she was going to said she couldn't have a refill because it was too early. And they told her, go to the ER. That's what everyone said. That's how we, we get really good at dealing with these problems because wow. everyone gets sent to the ER. So I go through the whole thing. This young lady, she was in her early 20s. She looked like almost like a heroin addict. She, she was bloated with just you. You could tell like this med, this was devastating her life yeah. and her body. So I listened I, the whole thing. And I just said I was not going to write her a prescription because it was not the right thing to do. She needed to get off the pills all of this stuff. And, you know, on one hand, the mom agreed with me, but on the other hand, and I think this is a lesson for people to understand. On the other hand, the mom is sitting there with a daughter who is in distress. And I'm basically saying, I'm, I'm not going to continue on yeah. with this, but then you're left with somebody who still has a problem. Right. So it's like, yeah. well, you could, you know, this is what wow. you need to do. You could go rehab. But basically they got really mad at me and said that they lived next to the um, president of the hospital and that when they got home, they were going to call him and say what a horrible doctor I was and how the ER there was horrible and that et cetera, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I, I said, well, make sure you spell my name right because mm -hmm. I'm not, it's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to contribute to this continuation of something yeah. that is not right because that's against my oath and, and it's unethical, et cetera. So this is, these are the kind of things that were happening and it, it yeah, there are not, we would call them narco bullies because once you, mm -hmm. if you said no to them, they would do really, they would say really, really vicious things to get, you know, Oh, I'm going to put a terrible online review about you. Oh, I'm going to complain. And they knew they knew all the levers to pull, but I, I always said no. <laughs> I, I mean, there's so much about what you said that's fascinating to me. First of all, I am curious, you may not have stats on this, but really quickly, what percentage of physicians who were in similar positions to you at the time were saying no to these people? Is there any data on that? Like how much of an outlier was your behavior? Great question. They they didn't really keep data like that. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, chatter initiatives within like our emergency medicine society saying, hey, you guys need to help us here because this is getting out of hand in the ER. Um, and, you know, it, we talk about the societies later. I mean, again, good people trying to do the best they can, but uh, you know, an emergency medicine society like the other societies 
coming up against basically the force of the the government saying, if you don't do this, your hospital is not going yeah. to get paid. So basically right. our association couldn't do much, but there's there's no data on it. Um, what, what did happen though, Sasha, is that um, the different states started passing um, prescription drug monitoring requirements. So yeah. that is one of the big things that really stopped the prescription writing or slowed it down. And from there, they could measure and track who was prescribing. And once there was a tipping point with some lawsuits and in this, that the feds then, of course, ironically started uh, writing letters to doctors who were over prescribing. Okay. So, um, but there isn't, there's no catalog of like, you know, the moral courage brigade. No, there's no, no. <laughs> yeah. and I didn't get any uh, extra b bonuses or no, that's the yeah. whole thing. Like you don't, you don't get anything for, you know, doing the right, right. Well, thing. we'll send you a, a medal or a little placard <laughs> yeah. or something from the gender of wider lens podcast. <laughs> Thank you for your bravery. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm also imagining, and I've, I think I've heard you talk about this, like, the, the amount of time that had to pass between these policies becoming an initial kind of standard at the hospital and then realizing like, oh, shit, people's lives are getting destroyed. Like there was a span of time. And I remember yeah. learning about the pain scales that were introduced as a screening yeah. process, not necessarily like, oh, this person has a cancer diagnosis and they're in their last year of life, we should assess their pain. It was like everybody was getting the pain assessment. And it's kind right. of like Stella, you and I have heard so many stories where a kid goes into the hospital ER because they are, you know, cutting or something. They have a litany of, of diagnoses. And then the hospital staff, the psychiatrist, therapist, whatever, are then screening them for gender issues. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, like, can you just talk about how like this became kind of a standard protocol and it wasn't like some evildoer drug money people, like it was just regular hospital protocol. Like you ask about this, you ask about your parents' mental health history, you ask about pain, like you ask probably about a million things and the same is probably true for gender to some degree. Yeah, it's but you know, the the pain scale, again, remember this stuff all started from a place of good intentions. The problem yeah. is once it gets into the regulatory apparatus, at least like I can speak towards the United States, it's a giant blob that it totally lags between the negative side effects, the negative consequences, and fixing it. And so to me, gender is like the sixth vital sign. Okay, so we have this thing, pain is the fifth vital sign, you know, it's like you know, your temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen level. Well, pain became the fifth vital sign. Like it became mandated to ask what the pain level was. That oh was a God. government regulation. Nobody was walking around with uncontrolled pain that I ever saw before this, where it was like, wow, we have a problem. But this came I, from can, top down. And gen can, yeah, sorry, Stella. Yeah, can go I ahead. jump in? Um, my, my sister is like, you know, she, she has a hilariously low threshold for pain. Pain is subjective. Yeah. So when my sister is saying it's a hundred and a million percent pain, I'd be going, that's right. Sure it is. As in, it really depends on the person, which s reminds me of gender. As in, it's, this is a subjective experience. So one person's massive pain is somebody else's. Yeah, it's, it's bearable. You know, I know somebody who got a filling without an anesthetic because she wanted to go out that night. <laughs> well, right. And it's not that if there's an, an, a particular issue going on that it shouldn't be addressed. The thing is, I think this is just a symptom of this sort of stage we are at with Western civilization and bureaucracies where, again, it's a top down, no nuance. It's just mm -hmm. a yes or no binary, ironically, or if there's a scale and obviously as things have become computerized, you know that they love a little scale or a yes, no, gotcha. or a one or a two. So What's anyways, that? gender clearly has become almost like the sixth vital sign, right? It's like, you have to do this. So it just comes from top down. Again, a lot of that same coming from a good place. These kids are troubled. We need to make sure we're doing the right thing. The problem is when you see that it has been misapplied and, it, and when someone gets a certain label, like you have a pain level of eight, I must give this because I need, you're treating the number, you're treating the regulation, you're not treating the patient. Oh my God. So with gender, that's exactly when you're talking about 
the stuff is top down. So, you know, I've tracked, looked back, it's, I think it's 10 years now that, that WPATH had worked on um, trying to get the medical record changed just in terms of the categories for biologic sex versus gender. So this has been going on a long mm. time that they've worked through the regulatory state understanding to have their policy prescriptions implemented. That's how they have to do it. So it's not just like one day someone walks in and the, the sex, the biologic sex field is gone. This has been going on for like 10, 10 years, but you see that all of a sudden it's just scaled up everywhere because it's coming down from a regulatory place. Um, it's not coming from someone going, oh my gosh, I'm so upset because at the hospital they called me you know, the wrong name or the wrong pronoun. I mean, yeah. again, I used to work in a neighborhood that served the, the gay and transgender community. There was never, ever one single problem no, everyone respected that how the person identified. It's just that it was clear on our medical record. Mm -hmm. You're registered as your biologic sex. And in a comment, it would say identifies, you know, likes to be That's called to I mean. identifies as female. No one had a problem. Yeah. Every no, no patients complained. No staff got it wrong. Everyone was respectful. So again, a regulation is coming down, solving a problem that like was not a widespread problem and the the um the negative consequences of that are are being you know ignored and the people who are saying wait a second there's some problems here again are are being you know ignored and silenced but it gets scaled because it gets put into into regulations we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors genspect and therapy first Genspect is an international organization committed to fostering a healthy approach to sex and gender. The team and members of Genspect strive to promote high quality, evidence-based care for gender non-conforming individuals. Genspect is pleased to offer a non-medicalized approach to gender with their recently published Gender Framework, and they continue to hold conferences around the world. Visit genspect.org to learn more. Therapy First is a non-profit worldwide professional association of mental health providers who view psychotherapy as the appropriate first-line treatment for gender dysphoria. Therapy First supports psychotherapists working with gender dysphoric youth and young adults and offers public education on mental health and psychotherapy. Visit therapyfirst.org to learn more. Now back to the show. Everything you said will, will lead nobody to be surprised that I, I'm thrilled that you have uh, become the director of Genspec USA, <laughs> because Genspec has expanded beyond my wildest dreams in the last couple of years since we established in 2021. And so now we're going to have some branches, really. You know what I mean? So you're leading Genspec USA. We've got other people who will be announced will be leading Genspec Australia, New Zealand and Genspec Canada. So it's all very exciting. But I'm thrilled. Can, can that you tell the audience what Genspect is, just in case some people don't yeah. know? So Genspect is an organization that advocates for a healthy approach to sex and gender. And on this on this mission, our, our, our effectively our slogan is a non-medicalized approach to gender dysphoria, because that's what we promote and we've written a gender framework, which is not a medicalized standards of care. It's a framework to show how gender can be incorporated into society if it needs to be, but always highlight and prioritizing the need to record sex, the sex of a person, and giving a very good defense about why, it, just like Carrie just said, why it needs to be recorded and um, highlighted, especially in certain cases. And so we go through it all in the gender framework, you know, law, society, prisons, schools, you know, sports and things like that. But one of Carrie's many brilliant um, projects for Genspec USA, which will be a, a huge campaign. She's just joined us and I, I'm so thrilled because we've worked so hard together with the WPATH files, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But one of uh, Carrie's brainchilds, and it's, it's absolutely phenomenal, which is the electronic records. So do you want to tell us about the electronic health records? you kind of your idea around that, because I think it's so important. Sure. Well, you know, I'm I'm honored what to have been offered to 
uh, run Genspect USA. You know, it's been uh, months in the making, and in uh, in um, you know, I I have such a, a fondness for for fair that helped me kind of you know advocate and do a lot of great things, and they they do so many different um, areas. Um, but you know, obviously, the gender you know is just so all encompassing, and it really is the linchpin that has gotten into the healthcare system that has caused really some, again, unsafe practices that are really just affecting everyone. At least with the opioid crisis, there was, you know, um, yes, everyone had to, it was asked the pain scale, but um, it, it, it cut, you know, it wasn't like they were doing, giving opioids to children. You know, this mm -hmm. with gender is so all encompassing. So to be able to join Genspect and, and really work on, um, helping to organize and continue just the amazing, you know, work that Stella has started is, is such an honor. But one of the, one of the critical things, you know, we're, we're going to work on are some of these key policy initiatives, because there's some other great groups in the U.S. like, you know, Do No Harm that's been working on policy initiatives. And this one, it relates to the electronic health record. There's been mandates again in the U.S. And I know there's some again in the U.K., um, related to that, all record uh, medical documentation, patient encounters have to be, um, elect, you know, electronic. And so there's these giant companies that have grown out over the past 15 years, the selling into hospitals because hospitals again are required to have electronic health record systems. Um, and I alluded, or I mentioned that WPATH about 10 years ago started advocating through regulations to basically have gender fields and other specialized fields related to, you know, an organ inventory, what organs does someone have, like kind of trying to get at th the fact that that is very confusing in terms of documentation. Like to omit sex and use other sex characteristics instead, basically? Yeah, I mean, basically, like my example where, you know, always had happened if someone was uh, trans identified, they would always be registered as their biologic sex because yeah. that's hard hardwired into the computer system. So you need to know, like, for example, if I was going to order a pregnancy test on a man, the computer system pops up and says, you're about to order a pregnancy test on a man, you know, because <laughs> that's an error. That's a waste of resources. What else am I maybe well, making an error about? The computer is clearly not sufficiently woke. So that's the well, problem. Well, so <laughs> it's basically now what's happened is that in a lot of these systems, like I work in the Epic system, but there's so there's a couple of big companies in the States, Epic and Cerner, um, Meditech. But in Epic, they in and it can depend on the hospital in the state because this is state regulated in our country. So um, like in Illinois, where I'm at, people can now register um, at a major medical center as just an X, like not a male, female, just an X. Wow. So the question is, the question is, how is that tied at the back end to like their biology? Like, and so for me, it, it, again, it's not about not being kind to someone who's trans identified. I'm because I, I'm in the world of what can go wrong, because that's what comes to the ER. I'm thinking, oh, my God, they're going to miss ectopic pregnancies. They're going to they're going to miss cancer screenings on, you know, mammograms or prostate screenings or cervical cancer screenings. Um, you and know, waste, I'm of of, waste of resources, waste of resources, waste of resources, man. And yeah, but it's just the the errors, the missed things, and and this wow. is opposite of everything that's been going on in healthcare has been all around safety. So to yeah. see a top down like some kind of a radical advocacy get into something like that and then get scaled up, and then you have these different states saying you're discriminating if you don't do this, you can guys can see how it scales up. So yeah. to answer, so, so what I, I have a, a model policy that basically says um, that, you know, it, it would be a law to, you have to register at a hospital, the electronic health record in the hospital has to have your biologic sex clearly identified as the main you know, input that is connected to all your data. So, and and it's just very simple. I think people can understand that. A lot of people don't know this is going on. I've I've 
I've been on the end of mistakes that have happened. I've I've contacted, you know, the appropriate people in my health system saying, hey, you know, there was an error here, like with, um, you know, like a quick example, I was once seeing a a gentleman in his 80s who came in with confusion. And um, we were getting the nurse was getting the history as I was talking to the wife. And um, she, the nurse couldn't, it, 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 the rec, the electronic record was asking for a gynecologic history. And um, this wasn't a trans patient. This was just, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it wouldn't let her advance in the record. So, so she, so, so it was just a complete error that um, she had to just put in like X's or O's or something to advance. Now, thank God this person was not like an extremist, but the point is, it went, something got crossed because there's yeah. all this confusion going on. And I think people think again, like, oh, it's computerization. They got this. No, I, there have been, there have been mistakes and um, there's no way to make sure everything is safe, that trans identified people are treated safely, don't miss um, important screenings or anything as well as everybody else. The electronic record has it, it's like your birth certificate or an ID. It has got to reflect your biologic sex because this is a safety issue. So, anyways, that's one of our initiatives we're going to work on, and we have some great partners who want to want to help. You on have that. other ones. Just say a little bit about CMEs, but then we'll we'll move oh, on. From oh, just okay. Like yours. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because they're very- yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, continuing medical education is like a you know a billion dollar you know business. Um, it it in continuing education units, and these are all part of just recertification with your license and and whatnot. And so we um, you know, have been working on. Uh, cre- creating, you know, high quality, awesome, uh, continuing medical education for doctors and therapists, you know, on on the topic, on the gender topic, but you know, from uh, the viewpoint diversity way that we all we all talk about it. And I, there are other companies out there doing gender CME for the um, gender affirming stance. Um, so we we need to have something you know for everyone on you know on our side and also i have not yet seen this to be a requirement of cme like i have to do stroke cme and some other subsets i haven't seen this yet with gender but i know that it's coming in our country because um even though we we have a lot of We've made a lot of headway, um, you know, uh, trying to put safety guardrails back into place. There still is a, a, a giant, giant bureaucracy related to this. So I, I think that they're go- there's going to be a mandate probably at state levels to have gender CME. So we want to offer mm-hmm. an alternative product. So we're working on that, too, with GenSpect. Oh, that's amazing. I think that will be much needed because, you know, we're we're often contacted, not necessarily by physicians getting their CMEs, but by physicians in training, people who are in, you know, graduate school or medical school. And they're telling us, you know, we are learning some very bizarre things. And I'm very concerned with physicians who are being trained today, that they're not getting actually accurate information. So that seems like a really important offering. It is. And you, you know, you raise, it's part of a larger point that, you know, we, we all are um, invested um, in, you know, critiquing appropriately saying, Hey, here, here's, here's what's not right. But as, as you both do, you know, in your private practices and through, you know, philanthropy and advocacy, you, you, you also have to have an alternative you yeah. know, and I can just tell you that physicians are just craving to belong to things that are aligned with medical ethics, that are aligned with a community of people who are practicing ethical medicine. There is, you know, that's part of how I got involved in advocacy because there is no community you know, for, for doctors like yeah. me, there should be the AMA should I, care yeah. or the, you, you know, but there isn't. And so we have to also provide, we have to be building new things 
for the generations coming below us because you, you have to have alternatives that people can join and be part of. I, I noticed like so often, I completely agree with you. I give um, an increasing number of talks to clinicians and usually in webinar format, maybe in the UK, it seems to be the, the highest demand. These are groups of clinics and stuff like they could be like up to 100 clinicians. They really want to know the psychology around gender. They are very, very interested in it. They have loads of questions. They're not unthinking. They're just kind of basically saying, I wasn't trained on this. Mm -hmm. This is extraordinary. And they're very psychologically minded. They want to know it. But on your your point, Carrie, I think uh, I think ethics in medicine is going to be the issue of the 21st century. I think the yeah. advances have got so extraordinary that ethics has yeah. really arrived into medicine in a way. It used to be, certainly in Ireland, ethics meant abortion or not abortion. You know what I mean? That's that yeah. was the, you know what I mean? That's what it was basically fine-tuned into. Not so much anymore. It's got to become a very big issue. I'd like to know what you think. Now, you and I have worked so hard on the WPATH files. It's been very exciting. Yeah. And we've you yes. know, really got to know, you know, <laughs> Michael and Mike Schellenberger and Mia yeah. Hughes, who, who wrote the report. An amazing yeah. team. But Great how people. do you yeah. think the WPATH files and ethics in general are going to impact doctors in the ER? Or am I wishful thinking? Or, how, you know, how does this get from the WPATH files to, and, you know, via ethics, how does it move into the doctors? How do we get it there? Because we all want to get it there. Well, there you go. Yeah, your that, question. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the, you know, <laughs> million dollar. $60 million question. Everyone's like, how do we, how do we bridge the divide? You yeah. know, um, what I will just say is just to echo what you were saying about, you know, connecting with the clinicians. It's just when I went to the American Academy of Pediatrics and we had the booth, you know, I really was struck by the information silo, you know, mm. that sort of at the association kind of bureaucratic level, they're really keeping the information out. I mean, we, we, we had so many, we had such a wonderful reception of, of, of pediatricians wanting to talk to us going, well, I've heard this decreases suicide, but there's something not right here. So the craving for the knowledge is there. And um, I just was shocked at how the information about the changes in Europe and detransitioners was siloed. We met, we met pediatricians who had never heard of detransitioners, which just seems to us like, how could that be? Yeah. So, so, so right. So the question is, how do we break down that? How do we get the silo, you know, broken down? And I think that's all what we're trying to do with all of the different advocacy things we do. I think the WPATH files are so critical. And as you said, you know, um, Michael and Mia, what, you know, great people and his whole team, you know, he really took on, um, you know, an issue and really is trying to do it its justice by, you know, doing this great report, putting into the context, really going out there with media, putting as, you know, he's, he's a different channel outside, I think, you know, our, our world of folks. So we are so, I am so thankful to him. And I know, you know, Stella, Sasha, you are. So I, I think it's, some of it is engaging maybe when we have someone like Michael or other people who are a little bit outside of kind of all the people we know is yeah. really being welcoming and being like, thank you so much because he is reaching a broader audience. Yeah. And, and I think that that is super important. I know so many people have worked on this for so long. Um, and obviously this moment wouldn't be happening for all the other great work other people have done, but I think trying to build bridges across into you know other other groups, which is one of the reasons I had joined Fair because they were reaching into other areas that I was you know unfamiliar, unconnected with. But I think it's it's also again building new things, creating engaging um, you know educational opportunities that people can also have as again CME because they need it. So trying to align the incentives again, but I think. We need to, you know, be out there with offerings that are engaging and 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 a community that's welcoming, um, because again, people are isolated and they're craving to like belong to something. So, 
Um, and I think it's, it's just we have to look at what's working well, what isn't working well, and not be bashful and not, you know, just kind of iterate and, and change. And I think that comes from, like, that's how my practice in medicine is. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm comfortable. I love like the startup or let's kind of change course here. But I think we just, we just have to keep, you know, doing all the, all the right things um, and uh, listen to just kind of diverse voices on this and build bridges, build, build more of a coalition, not, not, not less. Well, yeah. so I don't happened, know. I didn't really answer yeah. your question. Well, I mean, what would I happen if you said <laughs> to somebody at the ER, another physician or somebody, yeah. what would you say if, have you heard about the WPATH files or something? Yeah. Would they just go, who's WPATH? Or, <laughs> no, to me. They, it, 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 that might be the case. I think it depends again, where, where you're working. Um, so like, again, I'm not in an academic center yeah. where, yeah. So for me, I, I, I say some of the conversations I've recently had with some of my colleagues is about like, oh, in the red states, you know, they're um, like things with abortion and, oh, could doctors get, you know, whatever if there's an ectopic pregnancy. So some things like that. And I'll talk about it with them like, oh, hey, it, it gets into the same flavor where people see things so black and white. But um, I think, you know, doctors don't want to get sued, obviously. And I think a lot of things where we need improvement, where I'd also like to work on is related to documentation. I think that's an area where you can say to people, hey, if you're if you're in a place where you're seeing a lot of these patients, you need to be aware of all these lawsuits, you need to put in your documentation. Um, you know, this is the reason why I'm not doing X because mm -hmm. the patient has multiple comorbidities that aren't addressed. There is enough information out there that you can write a solid chart yeah. that is defensible and have a conversation with people who parents who are scared and unclear what to do. And I think Stella, that that's something, you know, I want to work on, too, is like, how do you document well? How do you interact with these people? Like as an analogy to that story I told you where the mom, you know, brings her daughter and is looking at me and they're all then when I tell them, yeah. no, yeah, you know, it so. Um, but I think I think it's just if you're in some of these heavier academic centers, um, and I think we're going to see more patients coming to the ER wanting to refill um, prescriptions for testosterone and estrogen. Some of the, like in San Francisco, that's going on a lot, I've heard through the ER channels. So some echoes, again, that happened yeah. in the opioid crisis. We'd, we'd love to ask you more about the conversations you're having on the ground at your hospital, because I think what's really interesting is that by definition, the people who contact us are dealing with issues in their community. So hospitals that are really pushing their kids to transition or school systems yeah. that are pushing it. But this isn't the case everywhere. And it doesn't seem to be as captured everywhere. So I think talking with you more about those conversations you're having day to day at work would be really instructive. Um, maybe we'll keep you on and maybe end the full portion here, the full episode here for our uh, kind of public listeners. Of course, we're going to highlight your work within Genspect and you've done such amazing work with FAIR over the last years. How many years were you with FAIR? Um, almost, almost three. I was yeah. one of the originals, one of the OGs, uh, <laughs> from, from way back, uh, when I started just as a parent volunteer. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anywhere else you'd like us to send people? Um, well, obviously to, obviously to, to Genspect and yeah. obviously I think the, the WPATH files, um, on Michael, on, on environmental progress, yeah. their website, um, I think it, it, there's so much there's so much there aside from the report that I don't know if if people have have seen and um and I guess your guys webpage I can't think of anything else right now. <laughs> I think that's pretty solid. Yeah, people yeah. who have not looked at the WPATH files should definitely take a look. And I also want to let people know 
you don't need like a 10 hour block of time to look at them. They have different things. They have right. very short summaries. They have highlight pages. And then they have Mia's full report, which is incredible and really worth yeah. reading. I would say treat it like a book, you know, read a few pages every day. But right. there are kind of short summaries that you can look at there that highlight the important things. Yeah. So does this feel like a good place to leave our full episode then? For sure. Okay. I, I leave it in your good your good production <laughs> hands to decide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you guys are Thank pros. you. Okay. Thank you so much, Carrie. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to visit us on Substack by going to widerlenspod.com. There you can join our listener community, access bonus content and resources, plus learn about additional ways to support the show. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 